Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the Leadership Development Podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. We're back, and I'm with the amazing Maurice. Maurice, how are you doing, man? What's going on? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me today. Yeah. So, Maurice, if there's anyone that is watching right now and they don't know about you, I would love for you just to introduce yourself and just share all the amazing things you're doing. Sure, absolutely. So I am a inspirational speaker, uh, a life coach. I went to school for education, so I have like an educator's heart. I've been a corporate trainer and all that. Um, but I really specialize uh, not only as a counselor, but also as a coach in helping people, um, whether they are in a broken place or they're just trying to build a better life, to really gain healthier perspectives and healthier insights on where they are and how they can grow from that place. That's awesome. And you're part of the Teach Better Speaking Network. So what are some things that you speak on? Yeah, so um, I specifically am able to speak to churches, businesses, schools, a little bit everywhere. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I speak about, you know, a lot of times, especially after this pandemic, people are feeling like they need to sit down and evaluate their entire structure. Like what just happened? That's where I come in, um, helping you to really evaluate your reset. You know, what do you value? Um, what are the strategies that you want to implement as you move forward? Um, and then I also um, work on something called the embrace, which is helping staff, helping uh, the people who you're working with to really embrace the moment that they're in, that, you know, there is so much innovation in this moment, but you have to allow yourself to get through your mental barriers so that you can get to that place of creation and, and inspiration. So just really, there's a whole lot of things that I cover with my, with my sessions, but it's just giving you a chance to break free. Yeah. So Maurice, you brought it up. Obviously we're in the midst of a pandemic. It's, it's gone on for a year and a half and, you know, this, this time for our professionals have been really tough. So, you know, we have some that are going through a lot of different pieces of, of hurt really from, you know, maybe it's a student that uh, has slipped to the cracks or maybe it's a pro professional disappointment. Maybe through the pandemic, there's been some type of trigger to trauma. Uh, maybe it's in their childhood or their adulthoods. Like what would you advise for them to help their healing? Yeah, that's such a great question. The interesting thing about this pandemic is that it forced us to slow down, right? So we're mm -hmm. so used to this fast paced world where when, when bad things do happen, sometimes we very quickly sweep them under the rug. Um, right. Whether it's the trauma you deal with, um, the student who slipped through the cracks, um, the disappointment months or year that you deal with, it kind of leaves you less than your best. Well, when all of a sudden everything starts to slow down, you are forced to actually deal with your stuff. And that can be really difficult. And I know mm -hmm. that a lot of people, we don't like to talk about this, but suicide rates have, have been up. The amount of people who have gone to rehab for treatment, for drinking and things like that have gone up. And that doesn't escape teachers. The start of it all is it all comes down to honesty. You, you have to be willing to work through the process of saying, you know, how am I? Who am I? Where am I today? And really take the time to assess that. And, and, and sometimes that deep dive, it can take weeks, months to, to actually do that work, usually not by yourself. Mm -hmm. One thing that I have, have told a lot of people is, if you feel like the last year of your life has been rough, you, you, you don't sleep well at night, a lot of tossing and turning, you're getting headaches, whatever it might be, Maybe you need a friend <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and that friend might be a, a counselor, a therapist, a life coach, somebody who can sit down and help you find healthier perspectives and help you, healthier perceptions of yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it starts. Being able to look at your stuff, look at your life, look at your habits and your routines and say, how can I heal? How can I evolve? How can I change? Yeah. So Maurice, you were a counselor prior to... And I know there are a lot of people that have a stigma about counseling. You just mm -hmm. said, you know, that first step is being honest with yourself and then seeking someone to help you through that. So mm -hmm. for those who maybe have that misconception of what a counselor is, why, why should they go seek help from a professional? <laughs> so the hardest thing to learn when you actually go to counseling is that you do most of the talking. Yeah. So a lot of times when people go to counselors, they get confused because their counselor asks them questions after question, after question. And it's really you 
getting a chance to start to internalize and vocalize the things you've been through in your life. Most of counseling isn't about the person sitting in front of you. It's about the you that looks at yourself in the mirror and understanding who they are, hearing your thoughts out loud and understanding how that affects you. Um, so much of counseling really is you getting a window into your own soul. It's not about the counselor looking at yours. And that's the hard thing, that's the misconception. If I, if I think you're brilliant and I think you're amazing, but you think you're horrible, terrible, and awful, what I think doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If you're an incredible teacher who changes so many lives, but you're hard on yourself for how you approach the classroom every day because of how you see other teachers doing it, it doesn't matter what I think about you as a teacher, your own criticality of yourself is gonna hold you back. And so that is what so much of counseling and coaching and even, even self-help, um, if you go that route, it's really about taking an honest look at yourself and understanding that there's nothing more important than how you look at you. Yeah. So obviously that's a difficult situation to be in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's really hard to go through that process. So for those who maybe have gone through those bad experiences, the trauma, failure, whatnot, and they have in the past kind of repressed that, what would be the negative aspect of not dealing with it and just kind of pushing it aside? Mm, that's a good question. So I'm gonna start answering that by saying, everyone has dealt with failure, and if you haven't, you're not trying hard enough, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, sure. So in other words, like we all fall short, like we all screw it up sometimes, like we all, mm -hmm. you know, our best idea is not always actually the best idea in life. And so the negative is when you allow your failures to define you. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing when the things you go through in your life shape you, right? Yep. Like if, if I have a bad experience in the classroom, um, uh, I don't handle a, a group of students in a, in a way that's the most professional. I, I don't handle my interaction with administration in a way that leaves me feeling good about me, right? right. Whatever my shortcomings are, if I allow those things to shape me, that can be good. In other words, growing up, maturing, learning better communication. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all good. But if I take a bad experience and I don't work through it, I don't learn from it, then now I just become the teacher with the bad reputation. I, I become the administrator who becomes defined by my, my shortcomings. Now I start to walk either in fear or anger or frustration because I don't like the way I'm perceived. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of us get to in life. And, and this is this is teachers, again, administrators. This is this is the, the janitor. This is the cafeteria worker. This is the student, too, by the way. Right. That yeah. when we don't learn how to learn from our experiences, then our experiences, instead of helping us grow to become better, they start to make us bitter. And that is the type of thing we want to try to avoid. Like we all screw up. But but will you learn from it? Will you grow from it? That's the key. You just talked about students, you talked about administrators and teachers. Mm -hmm. So for a school, what do you think is kind of that baseline that every school should have in place to help mental health, not only for their students, but then also for their staff? That's such a great question. The first thing I think is that you have you can't run from it as an organization, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, there are some organizations who truly believe we need to talk to our teachers about mental health. We need to talk to you about self-care. We need to check in on you and find out, hey, is everybody all right? Do we need to have some more social events to lift up spirits? There are some people who say, hey, I know you're a teacher, but feel free to stop into the guidance office if you're feeling down, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. There, are, there are some teaching organizations who value that. It's top down. If I pretend that these types of issues don't exist, then I'm going to end up with a whole lot of sick individuals in my school. And I don't mean sick like twisted. I mean sick like depressed, sad, burned out, frustrated. So I think that the key is that the organization from the top down needs to, to recognize teachers are people and the experiences that they have matter. If I don't help you process the loss of a student or a, a student, um, you know, students go through divorces, you know, their, their parents, uh, they, all these different, these different things that not only can, can impact the student, but can trigger you. 
if I don't help you deal with those things or help you deal with the disappointment that you wanted to move up from teacher to assistant principal and then the opportunity fell apart and it didn't work out and now you're still teaching or, you know, what I, there's so mm -hmm. many things that happen and these are the inner workings we don't want to talk about. Yeah. But if we're not willing to talk about them, how can we teach from them? And a teacher should be able to not only teach the people in front of them, they should be able to teach their self from life experiences. And that has to be encouraged. Mm -hmm. So for the leaders out there that are listening and talking about that top down, right? So mm -hmm. what can administrators and leaders do on their campus to help assist in mental health? Think outside of the box, be creative. What did, what did the pandemic do? Right. Mm -hmm. It forced teachers, administrations to completely rethink the classroom. OK, well, if you can rethink the classroom, why can't you rethink the way that you interact with your teachers? Come up with 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 mental health days for your teachers. Uh, give everybody a journal and encourage them to write in it. Um, check in with your teachers. Actually look at them and don't just watch them for are they teaching the lessons right, but look into their eyes and see are they OK? Do they look burned out? Do they look mentally fatigued? I mean, you have to be willing to rethink the education system the same way the pandemic forced us to rethink the classroom. And, and I think that when you're willing to do that, and there's a lot of great organizations who do, you find that you have healthier employees. You have people who, who feel cared about and loved and respected and cherished. And, you know, I mean, me, I've, I've worked, you know, different jobs as a counselor. Um, I've worked at churches. I've worked so many different places. I have learned that there's a major difference in the types of, of environment that I work in, where there's some where, the, yes, they respect your gifts, but they don't pour into you. Mm -hmm. They don't ask you how you are and mean it. And anytime I've been in an environment where someone cared enough not only to ask but to wait for my answer and pay attention to it and give me a resource if I wasn't okay. Those are the places where I was willing to work even harder and give more of myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. Give to your teachers who are giving everything to you. And, and, and there's not always an easy answer, but it's powerful. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, I just wanna make sure everybody that's commenting, if you have any questions for Maurice, he is an open book. So, open book. Open book. Whatever you want to ask, you can ask in the comment section and we'll make sure we get to it. But um, Maurice, I'm just thinking, right? You said certain leaders come and they, they pour into you. Mm -hmm. If there's someone out there that's watching and they don't have that environment mm -hmm. and they need to do some personal self-care, what can they do outside of their school to help with their mental health? Great question. Um, my answer is experiment. So in other words, what self-care works for me may not actually be the best thing for you. Mm -hmm. So you might need to kind of do some real experimentation. Um, so there are some people, they pick up a good book that gives them healthy perspective. They do the work and all of a sudden they're in a better mental space. Some people need to, to join a boxing club and go punch something <laughs> and get some yeah. of their extra energy <laughs> out because it clears their head and lifts their spirits. Some people need to pray. Uh, and, and get mental, spiritual clarity. Some people need to go fishing or go to the gun range. Mm -hmm. Some people need to, to journal, um, need a therapist, need a counselor. So I think that, that, that your true answer is that you have to be willing to experiment. And that means you have to do something. You must be willing to do something to get out of the rut you're in. Sometimes we're, we play the waiting game with our frustrations. Like if I wait for a little while. If I just sit in these feelings, they'll go away. Hmm. Well, that might be the case. And if, you, if you're kind of feeling off and you give it a day or two or five and it goes away, you might be fine. But sometimes what you've really done is just bury the emotions you are feeling and become numb to them. And that's the worst thing you can do. Generally, being healthy requires action either the action of acknowledging the feeling in order to grow from it or learn from it, or the knowledge of verbalizing your feelings to someone else to get healthy. Or like I said, doing a physical activity that is completely unrelated to the thing that's frustrating you so that your life has more balance. Um, one thing that, that I've learned and I've, for the Teach Better community, I've, I started doing these, uh, these videos called A Better You on my YouTube channel. 
Yeah. And one of the, the, the reasons for that is we're trying to give people these healthier perspectives, right? One of the things that I, I wrote or that I said recently was, if you pour everything out into everyone else and you become empty, what can you pour later? Now you're, you're pouring from a deficit. Yep. So what is it that you can add to your life that pours into you? What will, will give you more peace that pours in? What will give you healthier perspective that pours in or more insight or just a, great, a, a better feeling about yourself? I, I think that that is very personal. It is very much so tailored to you. So I can't tell you what to do other than do something and make sure you're willing to experiment to get the right formula. Yeah. So I want to dive into Maurice. So for your own mental health, do you have a regimen or something that you do every day for your own mental health? I'm, I can't do one thing every day mm -hmm. uh, because I'm, I'm, that doesn't work for me. That's part of the reason I decided not to be a teacher in the classroom because <laughs> go, <laughs> uh, going to the same room every day kind of drives me nuts. Yeah. Um, uh, right before we started the interview, you said, hey, do you have some really loud, like calming music playing in the background? I was like, my bad. Let me turn that down. <laughs> it was calming, though. I was at peace. You were at peace, right? Yeah. You, so that's one of the, that is one of my mainstays. Um, I, I believe in a calm environment for myself. So when I start feeling anxious or a little bit out of control, I like to change my environment. I play music. I change the lighting. Uh, I'm a person, I'm very spiritual. So, I mean, I pray. I, I truly believe in the power of prayer, the power of meditation. I read. And so there's certain things that I would say I do most days. But then sometimes I have to switch it up. I take my daughter for walks so I can get out into nature and get out of just being caged in. Yeah. Um, I try to read books. I've become much more of a reader since I've become healthy. Um, actually, that was a lie. I don't read. I do books on tape. Does that count as reading? Yes, it does. It does count as reading? It does. Do the educators agree? That that Ray, Hewer, Ray Hewer does the exact same thing. Okay. She swears by it. Okay, sweet. So I'm going to call it reading then. Yeah. So uh, I read books that challenge my thinking and my perspective. I listen to motivational speakers. I listen to sermons. I listen to people who are, who are trying to tell me everything's going to be okay. What you feel right now doesn't have to be how you're going to feel tomorrow, but the difference will be what you do about it today. Mm -hmm. I make sure that I feed myself healthy things so that I, I can then give away healthy things. That's so important to me. But but like I said, I'm being vague about it because it's, it changes by the yeah. day for me. And I think yeah. that for me, I needed variety. For some, of, for some teachers, they need a ton of variety because they are the person who they, they change the, the setup of their classroom every couple of weeks because they can't handle everything looking the same, right? Mm -hmm. Then you've got certain teachers who are very methodical and it's the same way, the same thing every day. Well, the person who's, who's systematic like that needs a methodical self-care lifestyle. I get up in the morning and I, and I meditate or pray or sit outside and just breathe or I journal or whatever it is I do in the morning. Then uh, halfway through the day, I do a check-in with myself. How am I today? When I leave work, I go straight to the gym. I work out for an hour and then I, I mix because it makes me feel good about myself. Then I sit down in the evening. I say, how did I do today? What did I do today? What could I do better tomorrow, right? Methodical. There's somebody else who needs to be like, as the wind blows, so blows my self-care. Today, I think I'm just going to go fishing just because mm -hmm. I think I'm going to I'm going to listen to something that makes me feel good. I'm going to call an old friend who always speaks life into me. Some people need to just just be more free. And so I think, again, that 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 all depends on you, your personality and the willingness to experiment to figure out what you need. So all that sounds wonderful. And I agree with everything you said, Maurice, like. Mm -hmm. I know that all of those things should happen, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I feel like there is a badge of honor that our society shows that if you work and work and don't think about your feelings, just press on, yep. you know, focus on the goal. Why do we think that that aspect of our life should just be pushed aside? Mm. It's interesting. I always talk a lot with clients about this concept that we as men deal with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, big boys don't cry. Yeah. When the truth is that real men absolutely do. So, so big boys don't, you're right. 
but men do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we're not supposed to grow into being big boys. We're supposed to grow into being real men. Real men have a full gauntlet of emotions, right? As do fully developed women. I think that some of it um, honestly has, you know, came from from generations that were before us. Um, There were some chiseled uh, men and women who were our grandmothers and grandfathers and great grandmothers and great grandfathers who lived through the depression and the world wars and so many things where if they were not that stoic, Mm -hmm. if they were not that rock solid, they may not have survived. And so I think that some of those attitudes were absolutely necessary for another time. Right now, certainly what we need is balance, okay? There is such a thing as being overly sensitive, not having any control over your emotions, always just just being a mess, right? (laughs) Like that exists, we've all seen that. But there is also this healthy place where I am strong enough to do my job. I am professional enough that I'm not going to let my emotions uh, interrupt or interact with a healthy work schedule, right? But then when I'm not in front of people, I can take off the armor, I can take off the the professional mask, and I can just be Maurice and figure out is Maurice all right? Mm -hmm. And I think where we get it wrong is that we think that behind closed doors, we have to be equally as stoic as who we are in front of our audience, in front of our beloved students, in front of our administrations, right? Yep. We feel like we have to be the same stoic. Well, you know what? I learned from my wife. She, she appreciates it when I take the armor off and get real. Babe, I'm struggling. I'm frustrated. I'm stressed out. Well, why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Now she's like, oh, so you're not a Superman like I thought you were? You have real emotions and and a real personality and real things that bother you? Well, now we can can work on it. Mm -hmm. We can work through it. Uh, We can get to healthier perspectives. And I'll I'll tell you one other thing that I've learned. And this for me was, was critical. I started helping more people when I started keeping it more real with the people I was sitting in front of. Mm. What I mean by that is, When I talk now as a speaker, even right now, I feel like people, when they look at me, can tell sometimes I don't have great days. I I am sharing with you that I have a self-care routine or ways that I approach things because sometimes I trip. Sometimes I get frustrated. I get angry. I feel broken. I want to scream. I want to yell. And because I'm transparent about that, When I tell you what I do to fix it, you're like, well, if it works for him, maybe I can try it. So the the level of transparency actually helps you become a better teacher. Isn't that what I'm doing right now? For whoever is engaged in this conversation, watching online or watches on the replay, they're hearing me teach. But I'm teaching from techniques and also from life experience. And and there's something that is about that that becomes more relatable. When I sit in front of a student and I keep giving them the same formula over and over again saying, why don't you just understand? And they're like, well, I want to understand. If I could understand, I would understand, but I don't know what to do to understand. The best teachers go sit down with the student after class and say, believe it or not, I used to struggle with this stuff too. Mm -hmm. And I remember some long days and long nights when I never thought I'd get it. But then I had this light bulb moment and everything changed. And I see that in you. And I want you to not give up on doing these assignments. Don't give up on yourself. I see where you could go. See, we've all as educators had those moments where we spoke life into the people in front of us and it changed their perspective. So when you ask me the question, why is it that we as a society won't both be more real and more open? I think, again, that it has to do with who we've been as a society, but I think for us to win in terms of where we need to go, we need to keep some of the past, professionalism, strength, uh, honor, integrity, high high values, high morals, those things need to stay with us. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand that there is absolutely a benefit to learning when to put the armor on and when to let the shield down. And that is a discernment thing. That's maturity. That's wisdom. It's not easy to find, 
but there's a balance. And I believe that the best teachers, the best administrators, the best corporate execs, they learn that. They, uh, uh, when I was in college, I had a professor. He always said the greatest teacher teaches the whole person. Mm. And that spoke to me that yeah. every lesson you teach, there's a lesson behind the lesson, right? Um, there's so many things that you, because you persevered in a math class at seven, at 37, you understand that a difficult situation in life is something you can work through, but you just have to sit down and work through it. And that takes courage. That takes bravery. That takes some of those same morals from back in the day, right? See how that yep. works? It goes together. Mm -hmm. um, but what I will say, and I'll, I'll wrap up that answer with by saying this. If, if you are the stoic type who never wants to interact with, deal with, or work through your emotions, and at the end of the day, you're healthy, happy, at peace, whole, you're a great parent, you're a great spouse, you're doing everything right, you're, you're a great teacher, and everything is great, stay that way. Don't mm -hmm. change. If, however, something is off, you've lost your pep in your step, you're feeling empty, burned out, bitter, frustrated, then you absolutely need to consider changing your approach. And I think that that's how you discern what you, which category you need to be in. Yeah. So I'm going to show this because Olivia's saying hi, and I want to say hi to Olivia. She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Maurice, I think that's a great point because this year, you know, it's almost the end of the school year. We've got mm -hmm. teachers that are reflecting on their practices, and mm -hmm. I know a lot of them are frustrated. They're feeling down because they feel like they failed in whatever learning environment they were in charge of, right? Mm -hmm. And they're taking it personal and they're saying, I'm identifying myself and, and my job and who I am based on the failures that I've seen this past year. Mm -hmm. So if you are an inspiration on YouTube, you have these amazing videos, and I just want you just to take a moment to speak to those people individually. What would you say to them if that's who they're identifying as, as, as a failure? Mm, mm, that's so good. I, I want to tell you today, the key to a successful life is not that you should never fail, but that you need to learn how to fail forward. To fail backwards is to look back at the past, define yourself by it, be beat up by it, and to end up farther away from the finish line than when you started. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get stuck back there. I want to encourage you that if you're like, man, I didn't handle this transition well. I, I, di I didn't have the balance I hoped I would. Uh, uh, I, was a great, I was a great teacher this year, but a horrible parent. <laughs> you know, like there's, there's so many things that happen in our lives when we're juggling, right? Yeah. If that's you, the key is not just to judge yourself, but to learn from the experiences from this year. And that takes rigorous honesty. Don't just say, what did you do wrong? First, start with what did you do right? What did you do well? What lives did you change? What people did you touch? Mm -hmm. If you look, I guarantee there's someone. And sometimes when we get down on ourselves, we have a tendency to just throw away the wins. Ah, that doesn't matter. Anybody could have done that. No, no, anybody didn't do it. You did. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn from it grow from it, looking ahead. And now I say, now that all said, all those wins, all those accomplishments, there's some things I didn't do so well. How could I do it better next semester, next year? How, how do I become a better teacher? How do I find more work, better work-life balance? Uh, how do I listen better to my students? How do I not be so temperamental, right? Whatever it is, it's not, man, I sucked before. It's, how do I add more value moving forward? Mm -hmm. That is how you fail forward. Now you are closer to the goal than where you started because all those life experiences did was expose some things that already existed. You already had a temper issue. You were just doing a good job of hiding it. You already had issues with your work-life balance. They just spilled over this semester. Uh, <laughs> you oh. already struggled with communicating with your students and not being able to get your ideas across. It's just that you felt more exposed in this season. They were already there. 
admit that you feel exposed and then say, what if I was thankful for the exposure? Because now I know what to work on. I know what areas to grow in or heal in and get better in. And now I have positive momentum to move me into my summer to where during the summer months, instead of, instead of lamenting all summer long how terrible of a teacher I was, all summer long, I work on new habits. I work on new techniques. I find some new books that I want to teach that I wasn't teaching before. I come up with some more creative ways to, to interact with the classroom. Now I have forward progress to move me into next year so that I'm a little bit better than I was before. Forward progress. Fail forward. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. So what about the person who's watching and is like, Maurice, you know what? I am successful in everything I do. Mm -hmm. However, they're still feeling stressed mm -hmm. or they're still feeling depression or they're still feeling some negative things, right? Yep. So as far as those folks, do they need some personal development still, even though they're finding success? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no one wants to hear this word, but I'll use it anyway. You have a spiritual issue. Mm. So, you know, when, when you teach a person, it's that mind, body, spirit thing, right? So most teachers, we speak to the mind. We speak to the intellect, the reason, the rationale, okay? That's incredibly important as a teacher. Then there's the physical teaching. Uh, we all know that there are certain methods and techniques that involve the physical, not just physical education, but also when, the, when the, the student actually writes something down, when they write on the board, when they interact with something physically that actually uh, you know, triggers things in your mind that engage and increase learning. Well, the, the thing that we all also have to deal with is the spiritual side of learning and growth and development. And many of us have never, we've never gone there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually writing a book right now about just that. The fact that um, in my 20s, I, I accomplished some, some cool stuff. Uh, if you read my resume, if you read my biography, it sounds awesome. But I was depressed during most of it. Mm. I, I, I checked marks off the list of things people want to experience. And yet they were hollow victories. Well, to me, that is a spiritual emptiness. Mm -hmm. I went through most of the things I was going through thinking about the next thing, right? So instead of living in the moment I was in, I was like, well, as soon as I get done with this, I'm going to have to do this. And so while I was doing it, I was thinking about the next thing. So I was washing the dishes, but I was thinking about what I was going to do after the dishes. I was teaching the group of people, but I was thinking about what I needed to do after teaching the people. And so when you looked at me, I was gone. That is the rat reel that most people run in, the hamster wheel mm -hmm. most people are in in their lives, that they are not fully present. They are not fully engaged mentally, physically, spiritually in this moment, not rooted and grounded in this moment. And you need to learn how to slow down to truly understand the power of the moment you're in. If you feel like you're disengaged, if you feel like, man, I accomplished things, but there's something missing. I, I, I won award for best teacher, but I don't even remember teaching this year. That means you need to learn how to breathe in the moment you're in. It sounds like, it sounds like, you're like this guy's a little wacko, but at the end of the day, isn't this the life? Mm -hmm. This is all you get. You only get one. And if you're moving too fast to appreciate the moments you're in, you need to learn how to slow down. For me, my life changed when I learned the power and the importance of right here and right now. So the example I just gave you, you asked me, what does a teacher do who's been beating their self up? My answer was, don't just stare at the past and beat yourself up, but instead to fully engage in how do I feel? What was good? What was bad? What can I learn? What could I do now? Now, every day I can methodically learn something new. 
engage in something new. It keeps my senses firing. It keeps me active. It keeps everything in my brain firing the way that I need it to. It's a spiritual answer. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm doing cognitive exercises or I'm working on physical routines, it's spiritual. And so people don't like that word, but it is often the answer to the emptiness and brokenness people feel. So how do we identify that, Maurice? Because I love what you're talking about, but you know, when you're talking about the disengaged and focused on other things and you know, all of those nonverbal things that you were speaking of, I can just mm-hmm. imagine people in the classroom, the students, right? Or mm-hmm. teachers or administrators that are are looking that way. So, you know, I was thinking of Olivia's comment there, right? Like mm-hmm. as a head teacher, how mm-hmm. do I support others? So mm-hmm. how do I how do we even identify that that might be something that's going on in their life that we can help assist in? That's a great question. I, I think you know more than you think you know. <laughs> yeah. What I mean by that is sometimes we look into a person's eyes and something is off. And we find ourselves asking a person, you good? Are you okay? Is everything all right? And they look at you and smile real big and they tell you everything is okay. What, what made you ask the question? What made you wonder about them? When you went home, why is it that you kept thinking about them? Because some, your knower knows, okay? Mm-hmm. And so what I would tell people is sometimes you have to trust your intuition. Um, if, if it's a, a coworker, if it's a student, and day after day, you just sense something is off. Sometimes you just need to make yourself available enough that when they finally feel comfortable enough to tell you what's wrong, you're there. Sometimes there's nothing else you can do, but let them know your moment hasn't passed. Your opportunity hasn't gone away. When you finally feel like talking, I'm here. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the importance. It's trust yourself. We all have the ability, if we are slowing down, because let's face it, some of us are actually really good at reading the issues of others. It's just ourselves we we get, we're off on, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see something's wrong, if you see something, say something. That's something that's, that's a very popular phrase amongst teachers, right? If you see something, say something. It, you can see it in a person's eyes, in their body language. Uh, yes, exactly, Olivia. She said, ask a second or third question to dive deeper. That's yep. it. If a person's not willing to answer at that moment, it's okay because now you've planted a seed. One thing that I've learned is that you don't get to decide what seeds grow when. Hmm. If you've been teaching for a while, you probably had some seeds that you planted in some students where you started, you tried to speak life into them. You tried to encourage them. You tried to motivate them. And by the time they left your classroom, they didn't get it. And then they come back to you two years later, five years later, 10 years later. And they say, you said something to me all those years ago. And I finally figured it out. You don't get to decide when the seeds that you plant grow. So your job is just to plant the seeds. And I think that that is the most important thing you can do. Just be a seed planter. Water mm-hmm. those seeds as much as you can. Speak life into people. Encourage them. But know that it'll grow when it's supposed to. And that's kind of hard because as a farmer, right, if I'm planting a seed, I get to see what is growing yep. and the end product. But for a teacher or an administrator, you don't get to see the end product a lot of times. That's true. But as a, as a farmer, I also understand the importance and value of seasons. Mm-hmm. I understand that there are certain seasons where nothing grows and everything looks dead. And there are other seasons where things emerge. And if I look at life that way, then I understand maybe this is just this person's winter season. They're real cold and icy right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you when you ain't having it. Okay, but the spring is coming. <laughs> yep. So just plant the seeds when it's the time to plant them and trust the process. See, we expect the people around us to to trust the process when we teach, right? Uh, I put I put a formula on the board and all the stu- the students have to f- have just stuff coming out of their ears, right? They got smoke coming out of their ears because they're overwhelmed. But I know that if I'm a good teacher, if I methodically go through this, I can teach you how to understand and comprehend step by step how to execute the formula, right? Mm-hmm. I just have to tell them, look, I'm a teacher, You be a student and trust the process. I tell a person, I need you to write this long paper. And they say, I got to write 10 pages. 
I don't know how to write a paragraph. Yeah, but you'll get there. We're going to work through this book report and I'm going to show you how to research. I'm going to I'm going to teach you how to find good critical items in there. I'm going to teach you how to not plagiarize so you can use your own words. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go through this process. And by the end, you're going to be able to write this full report. Trust the process. Well, when it comes to spiritual growth and spiritual health, it's no different. It's just that sometimes the timetable is longer. The window of when a person get, goes from, from bad to good, from unhealthy to healthy, it can just take longer. So it's on you to trust the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. So let's keep going down this road, Maurice. So we just talked through the nonverbals, mm -hmm. but what if it is something that's extremely obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Someone has been triggered, there's trauma that has been exposed. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a student, it could be a staff member. Mm -hmm. What are some things in that moment that our educators can do to kind of de-escalate the situation and, and find out what the true problem is? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a couple pieces of, of wisdom. And the first one is don't always try to do everything on your own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. So one thing that you know in the school environment is that there are experts who have studied how to de-escalate situations. Sometimes if, if you are truly unprepared to handle the situation, you can do more damage than good, right? Sure. So the first thing you need to do is be wise, wise enough to know, is this a situation where I can make a difference? Or is this a situation where I need to know who to talk to and to know that that's the difference? Sometimes the, the best difference is knowing your resources, okay? Yeah. Now, that being said, a student comes up to you they're in a bad place and you're the only one they trust and they dump some heavy weight on you that you didn't see coming and you don't know what to do. Understand the importance of questions more than the criticality of giving statements. Mm -hmm. When I ask a person questions, I usually help them more when, than when I just try to figure out something good to say. Oh my God, this happened and that happened and this happened and that happened. Well, well how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to feel. I feel this and that and this and that and this and that. And who have you talked to about it? Who, who, have, you, who have you worked through this with? Well, questions often are more pack, impactful and powerful than just trying to search for answers. Well, have, have you prayed about it? Have you talked to your parents about it? Have you, have you worked through it? Have you gone to, this, to the guidance counselor with it? Mm -hmm. so, Sometimes what I need to learn how to do is to engage the person in front of me and give them a chance to speak through their situation rather than just trying to speak at them. If you don't know what to say, don't say anything, ask. I think there's a whole lot of value in that. So it's, those two, it's a twofold answer. Again, it's knowing your resources, knowing if you're really the best person to talk in that situation. And then also understanding the power, not just of trying to always give wisdom, but being wise enough to know when you don't have the right answer. Yeah. And know that maybe they're in a space that they're not listening or hearing a word that you're saying. <laughs> yes. 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 If you see the glossy look and you're oh, speaking yeah. at them and it's not, you're not getting anywhere, mm -hmm. they, they didn't come to you for answers then. Yep. They just came to you to be heard or understood or seen. So right. in that moment, hear them, understand them or see them. Mm hmm. And for a student that's maybe acting out, you know, obviously behavior is a, a form of communication, but it's not viewed as that every single time. Correct. So how can we get to the bottom of the behavior and why is it, why is it existing in the first place? You know, that, that takes patience. Um, that takes discernment. The reality is that most acting out is secondary in nature. It is, you know, anger. If, if I got a student who's always anger, always yeah. temperamental. But anger is a secondary emotion, secondary to, to sadness or grief or pain of some kind, right? So I have to go back to my teaching. We all learn the teaching and the psychology of the student, right? And of yeah. emotions or of your teachers, your fellow teachers even. I need to remember what are primary emotions and what are secondary emotions. Sometimes what we do is we want to believe our eyes Instead of, believe, instead of believing our training. Well, mm. your training is what's giving you your wisdom. And sometimes you have to lean on what you know, not just what you see. Uh, as a spiritual man, they call that faith, 
right? Yeah. <laughs> I have to have faith that my level of discernment and understanding tells me this student seems like they're just tripping, but really they're struggling. Something else is going on. The, uh, mom and dad are fighting every night. Uh, mom never comes home and they're feeding their self and their kids. Yep. Some, uh, something is happening, right? I had to start to have faith that my training, that, that my learning and growing and maturity as a professional, if my spidey senses are tingling, it's for a reason. And I have to learn how to, f how to find that balance. I have to manage my classroom. I, I have to make sure that I address behavioral issues when they come up, but I can't get so overboard with that that I forget to look and figure out what is really happening. I think that's all so incredibly important. Yeah. Yes, exactly, Maria. She said, lean on what you know, not on what you see. Because yep. sometimes what you see is deceptive. Absolutely. Very much so. Yeah. Keep those comments coming. And then if you have any questions for Maurice, we only have a little bit of time left. I don't know how that's possible, Maurice, because I feel like <laughs> I've been with you for like five minutes. It's gone pretty quick. It has. And I love all the wisdom that you're providing. I know that some folks have been jumping in um, as we've been having these conversations. And so I just kind of want to leave with some helpful tips, right? So, you know, I've already kind of stated it before, we're, we're on the back end of the school year and people are in various places in their life as far as their mental health. Mm -hmm. If you could just provide, you know, maybe one, two, three things that they should be doing tomorrow to help their mental status, what would that be? Okay, so three things. The first thing I'm just gonna say is simply do something. Do something. So there's no right answer to what you need to do with your mental health, but I can tell you that the wrong answer is to do nothing. Yeah. If you are feeling fatigued, burned out, stressed out, frustrated, you must engage in something healthy. So the first answer is simply do something. I always encourage people that the best thing you can do is to get a good sense of the person staring at you in the mirror. Okay, so the best ways to do that are either to sit in either prayer or meditation, sit in silence, sit outside, and truly get a full grasp of who is the person who's sitting here in this moment. Are they okay? What's broken? What's frustrated? One way to do it is that way, and another way to do it is through journaling. Mm -hmm. writing exercises. You can go to Google and you can find writing prompts that, that just help you write down what you're going through, what you're feeling, and how you should work through that. So, so I would say to start off, number one, do something. Number two, do something to get a gauge on how you are right now. Whether it be something that just involves sitting in the quiet or involves a actual written activity. And if those things don't work, you may have to go to a therapist or a counselor in order to do the second one. It may yeah. require a person to sit in front of you and pull out of you how it is that you are and what it is that's going on. Yeah. The third thing that I would say is, have you found any hobbies? Do you have anything that makes you come alive? Anything that, that gives you life, anything that gives you positivity, um, that, that freshens you, that a lot of times what people find is that when they're feeling burned out, it's not about what they've been doing, it's what they stopped doing mm. that's causing them the most frustration. You used to go fishing every weekend and you sat outside with your pole and, and it was good for you mentally, it was good for you spiritually to just be in that environment. Uh, you used to go and, and play basketball at the YMCA with your buddies and for some reason you got out of it. You were reading books and you were doing book clubs and it was so good for you cognitively and, and mentally and then you stopped. If there is something you've stopped doing that was giving you life, you may need to revisit it. So I think those are the, the, the top three things. The first thing is just simply do something. The second thing is make sure you have a grasp of who you are today and how you are today. And I gave you a couple of different ways you can do that. And the third thing is make sure you are engaging in some kind of activity that is good for you, that enhances you, or that gives you a, a deeper level of perspective and peace. Yeah. So Maurice, you've, throughout your answers, have talked about different projects that you're a part of, mm -hmm. first off, let's talk about YouTube, right? You have a Friday show that you put out that's associated with Teach Better, but I know you do other things too. So can you just share that project with 
our listeners? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the easiest way to find me, uh, you can go to mauricefmartin.com, which is, just went up, so I'm still it's a, still a work in progress. But mm -hmm. feel free to find me on there. Uh, you can find me on YouTube. My YouTube channel is called Today's Inspiration. So if you type that in on YouTube, you can find me. Subscribe to my channel. I am always trying to give fresh new ways to help people uh, uh, get from where they are to where they're going. Uh, on top of that all, I'm writing a book. Uh, and uh, actually today I spent my entire day writing today because I'm just committed to finally getting this book done. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I am I am a, a speaker. So if there is a teacher, um, an administrator, somebody who wants me to come and speak at your school, um, I would love to do that. So reach out to me or reach out to the Teach Better team and we can absolutely arrange that. I'm also a, a coach. I'm a life coach. So there may be somebody who's watching who's like, I feel like if I talk to this guy once a week, for the next couple months, I probably would be stronger than when I started. Or I am one of those teachers who feels like I've been failing and I don't like this feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I want to do something different in the summer so that when I go back to school, I'm in a better place. Well, you can consider me as a life coach. Um, you know, I, I have different packages that I offer, um, some that are just one month, some that are three months, and then I have one that is a, a nine month package. But it gives you the opportunity to sit down with somebody who not only will help you with your perspectives, but also help you with accountability. You said you were gonna start going to the gym. Did you go? Right. You said you were gonna read that book. Did you open it up? Right, and so just giving you those opportunities to really challenge yourself so you can grow. So there's a lot of different ways that people can find me, um, can reach out to me. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Uh, so if people are looking for me, they'll definitely find me. That's interesting. So we're, we're really focused on professional development, but we're not really mm -hmm. focused on the personal development. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what you give, right? Yep. I believe that personal development is professional development. Mm -hmm. We just have a lot of professionals who aren't well-rounded. That hurt somebody's feelings. I'll say it one more time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have a lot of professionals who are not well-rounded. They are mm -hmm. a one-trick pony with a good trick. And so when life happens, when a pandemic happens, when crises happen, sometimes some of our professionals crumble because they're not well-rounded. Sure. Or when, you know, when, so I'm a great teacher, but I don't know how to be a good husband and my marriage is falling apart at home, even though I'm brilliant in front of my students. Sure. We have a lot of people who are not well-rounded professionals. And so I believe that that personal development is professional development. Yeah, that's amazing. I love it. So social media, how can people connect with you, Maurice? So at Maurice F. Martin, I'm on Twitter. I kind of stink at Twitter though. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you have to know when you're not good at something. I'm not good at Twitter. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on uh, Instagram. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. Um, so you can find me at all the, ma the major uh, social media. And then, of course, again, at YouTube. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, you're going to get a bunch of Twitter followers now. They're, they're going to challenge you. I know it. Um, but I, I, love so. your, I love your transparency. That's awesome. You're doing what you preach right now. Maurice, you are a joy. You have so much wisdom and insight on this topic, and it has been a true honor to be able to spend this hour with you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this, and um, you know, just thank you. I hope uh, people got something out of it. And, uh, just thank you guys again for having me. I appreciate it.